Hey there, this is a weekly compilation video that combines a number of my shorter videos into one longer video. If there's one of the videos you're particularly interested in, there should be chapters on this video and in the pinned comment. Otherwise, grab a snack and have fun. Let's get this started. So, every so often, some streamer or YouTuber will find themselves arrested in a foreign country, usually because they don't brush up on local laws and try to do something that would be fine in Los Angeles, but isn't exactly fine in a more reserved and conservative country. The most famous example of this is Johnny Somali, who spent months in jail in Japan awaiting a trial. But now, there's another who seems to be in trouble in a pretty scary country, and the lack of details is slightly concerning. Neon is a kick streamer. From what I can tell he does IRL streams, and he's now allegedly locked up somewhere in Dubai, part of the United Arab Emirates. Now if there's one place you probably don't want to go to jail, it's the Middle East. I can't speak for Dubai's prison system specifically, but I just think that it's probably a good idea to not get arrested in a country where being without air conditioning for a prolonged period of time can kill you. Neon's probably not having a great time, but what happened? What's he charged with? Well it's not exactly clear. What we do know is that the last stream he did on kick before disappearing showed him and his girlfriend, Sam Frank, being approached by police officers and talking about how they had filming permission before being led away. Put the camera down, down. Oh, okay. Oh, it's off. All cameras are off. I just want to let you know we're trying to work with you guys. I'm really sorry. If we can't film it, it's a problem. We can we can just leave if that's a... But the people... The people... The uh, services said we're okay. If it's not okay, we can leave. We don't want problems. Okay, okay let's... I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I'm so sorry, sir. So I understand that um, it's not official, right? Are we going to jail? Are we going to jail? Where are we going? To the office, they said. But we went to guest services. That's where... Okay, guest services is where we got permission, ma'am. I want to let you know. So anyone who can clear this up is going to be in guest services as well. Oh, there's a bl Brooklyn's Believe It or Not. They didn't give us anything. They just basically yeah. they were going to send... That's the they camera. They said they were going to send... They took a picture of my passport. And they said huh? they would send it to the WhatsApp group chat. Close, close, close. Close it. Close. Close. Put it down, just put it down, bro, put it down. What are you doing, bro? Put it now that doesn't look great. From what I can tell, Dubai has some pretty strict privacy laws. From what I looked up, filming or photographing anyone without their expressed consent is a crime in the United Arab Emirates, with some pretty harsh penalties, including six months of jail time and fines. It sounds like his group knew that, since they were telling the police that they got permission from guest services, but maybe they ended up accidentally filming the wrong person or something. No one really knows, but there's one thing I do know. When the only person giving out breadcrumbs of details of what happened is Aiden Ross, you're probably in some serious trouble. Aiden's a friend of Neon, and he very briefly talked about the situation on stream. He doesn't give out many details, probably because he learned his lesson when he accidentally said the wrong thing and got Andrew Tate arrested. But what he does say doesn't sound good. I'm gonna just say this though. I'm doing everything that I can do to try to help, but people around him made it really hard because there's clips like, I'm not gonna say specifically who, but you guys can put two together. Someone around them mocked them pretty bad to where it's, it's like, they fucked it up, I'm not gonna lie. Based off what they said. Who cares, I'm gonna stop talking about it, but it's, it's fucked. Bro, Citrus. Now, I mean, there's not a lot of information there. Aiden says that someone made some statements that made everything worse for Neon. My assumption is that Neon and his crew screwed up the filming rights or didn't understand the laws and someone reported them. I think it probably really won't have helped that they didn't immediately turn off the live stream when they were approached by the police, either. Dubai isn't America. They don't mess around over there. If he was breaking another law, for instance, if he or anyone in his crew had drugs on them or even in their hotel, then they're really, really screwed. They do the death penalty for that kind of thing over there. But the 
the problem is that there's so little information that we don't really know what they've been charged with. All we know is what we saw in the first clip, that the initial conversation with police had something to do with their filming. What happened after that is all a mystery. A few days ago, it was trending on Twitter that Neon had been sentenced to a year in a Dubai prison, but that doesn't appear to be true at all. No one was able to actually find any source or record of it, and it seems to have originated from a random Twitter account, but that's how desperate people are to find out exactly what happened. The only thing that I think I can say with certainty is that I wouldn't want to be in his shoes right now. This kind of thing has been happening all too often recently. IRL streaming outside of the USA and maybe a few select European countries is kind of a legal minefield. The risk probably isn't worth taking. Not to mention, for whatever reason, when these streamers are arrested, it's always in countries like Japan or Dubai, places that are well known to have strict laws and heavy enforcement. Honestly, I don't know why anyone would take the risk of doing something that might even be thought of as potentially illegal in any of those countries. No one wants to be locked in a foreign prison having to use a translator to talk to their lawyer, who probably won't be as good as they normally would because every conversation you have with them is through a translator. It's a mess. What do you guys think? Is Neon screwed? Do you guys think that he will see the light of day anytime soon? Or is this this another Johnny Somali scenario, and he'll be released with no real consequences in a few days. Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching all the way till the end. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. After all, you watched the whole video. Have a great day, and God bless you. They knew me, chat. I was really welcomed. I was a king in there, bro. They were giving me free, like, free beds. It was fire, bro. It was fire. It honestly made me look at things different. I swear to God, I was ready to I was ready to just chill there with the boys, bro. So, just the other day, I made a video talking about how the kick streamer Neon had been arrested in Dubai, and no one knew anything about what was happening to him. There were all sorts of rumors floating around, but all that anyone knew for sure was that he had a confrontation with police in Dubai during one of his streams. Then, nothing. No news, no comments, no one was saying anything about what happened to him. As it turned out, he had been held for more than a day in custody by the Dubai police. Now that he's free, he took to his stream to explain what happened. So let's talk about it. Basically, like I had said in the last video, it boiled down to him and his crew filming somewhere that he wasn't supposed to. But it got worse from there. As you can see in this clip, when the police confronted them, his cameraman continued to film for the stream and didn't turn it off, even though they told the police that they had turned off the cameras. It's not okay, we can leave. We don't we to, want problems. go to the office and after the office. I'll tell you Okay. Put the camera down, down. Oh, okay. It's off. All cameras are off. I just want to let you know we're trying to work with you guys. I'm really sorry. Now, if you know anything about places that are not the United States, it's usually a bad idea to mess with the police. You don't have the same rights there that you have on good old American soil. As it turns out, filming those police officers was a really bad mistake. Neon explained why in his first stream back. And then chat, the, the real situation was we, we accidentally filmed the cops, bro. We act... The like his eyes were popping wide open filming the cops where he's like excited bro I don't know what the f he was doing bro the idiot filmed the cops it wasn't his fault though. I don't blame him I take full accountability it was my fault and honestly things could have been a lot worse but I, I I really appreciate um I really appreciate all the people who try to um who try to make sure I was good man so it seems like from that that Neon may not have realized that the cameraman was still filming after the cops arrived but the most interesting thing to me is that normally when the kickstreamer crowd finds themselves in hot water with the authorities the last thing that they will do is take accountability but Neon actually is, which is a massive W for him, because at the end of the day, it was his stream that filmed the police, so even if he wasn't the one holding the camera, the accountability falls to him. I'm surprised that he managed to get out of jail so quickly though, filming the police is a really, really bad idea in Dubai. But honestly, this isn't a Johnny Somali situation, it appears that Neon actually might have learned something from this ordeal, which is a really good thing. He went on to talk on his stream about how he was behind bars for at least 37 hours, and that he learned that actions have have consequences while in there this is a really it was it was it was a really crazy sh situation bro it was a really sh situation i was in that uh behind bars for probably like approximately like 37 hours or some sh chat it showed me genuinely that actions have consequences bro actions have consequences you can't go around in dubai the most safe and respected place ever recording whatsoever like whatever thinking i could just get away with that I, 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 I thought i was invincible bro i thought i was invincible 
But in reality, look at me, I'm a little piece of sh And there we have it. He thought he was invincible, but now he realizes that he was wrong. It's actually really nice to see one of the IRL streamers learn a little bit about self-accountability. And I actually respect Neon more now that he said this. Even from my own experience, not that I've done anything like what Neon did here, but I found the same thing to be true. We all think that we are invincible when we're young. Some people get the reality check before others, but sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. I think the loss of the idea that you're invincible is really the start of adulthood. And I don't mean knowing that you're not invincible, I mean experiencing it. You can know that you're going to die one day for years, but you never really think it'll happen until you get close. And that changes how you approach life, I think. At least it did for me. So hopefully we'll see Neon be a little more adult and take less crazy risks in his content in the future, because it really seems like he learned his lesson here. What do you guys think? Did Neon really learn his lesson? Or will he go back to doing this kind of crazy stuff in the future? Let me know in the comments. Personally, I think that once you realize how fragile everything is, you never go back. At least if you're sane. So I'm hopeful for his future. Anyway, thanks for watching all the way till the end. Remember to like and subscribe. After all, you watched the whole video. Have a great day and God bless you. So, nowadays, YouTubers have the influence that actors and other celebrities had in the early 2000s. It's honestly weird how influential some YouTubers are. One of the most influential YouTubers, at least when it comes to technology, is Marquez Brownlee, otherwise known as MKBHD. He's got one of the largest tech review channels, currently sitting at over 18 and a half million subscribers. But he's found himself in some controversy, since some people aren't happy with how brutal his latest review was. Today, we're going to talk about that and his response. This whole mess is about this thing called the Humane AI Pin. The best way I can describe it is if you had a Star Trek badge on your chest, and when you tap it, you can ask it questions and an AI answers. It also has a little projector in it, so you can use your hand as a projector screen to see a visual projection of what it can do, but its main selling point is the AI. Unfortunately, it's gotten a ton of negative reviews since it launched because it turned out to be less Star Trek technology and more of just a slow, frustrating cell phone replacement that doesn't even have all the features of a cell phone. I think the genuine sentiment that a lot of people have around it is that it's cool in concept, but the execution just isn't there. Marquez went into detail with all the problems with the Humane AI pin in his review of it. For what it's worth, his review was more than fair to the Humane AI pin, pointing out its good qualities, but, well, there were just more negatives. What's got Marquez into trouble is his title for the video, which is the worst product I've ever reviewed for now, which, though a little inflammatory, actually I think sums up what he said in the video really well. But this comes after Marquez was largely given credit for the looming decline of the car company Fisker. After his review of their car went viral, that review being named, this is the worst car I've ever reviewed, which was very critical of the many flaws he found with Fisker's car. When Fisker started to show signs of severe financial difficulties after the review got a lot of attention, a lot of people started saying that Marquez's review killed the entire company. Now that's not exactly true. From what I can tell, Marquez's video probably rubbed salt in the wound, but since their product is not great, at least for now, the company was already in a dangerous position. Basically what I'm saying is bad products kill companies, not bad reviews. A lot of people haven't come to that conclusion though, and are now worried that Marquez calling the Humane Pin the worst product he's ever reviewed will harm the company that made the Humane Pin. Despite the fact that every review of the pin I've watched all basically summed it up in the same way. They said that it's not really useful compared to a normal smartphone if they didn't go as far as he did. The product was bad, but it's not going to stop people from placing the blame on Marquez. Marquez was called out in a viral tweet by a guy named Daniel Velasso, who said the following, referring to Marquez's title, I find it distasteful, almost unethical to say this when you have 18 million subscribers. Hard to explain why, but with great reach comes great responsibility. Potentially killing someone else's nascent project reeks of carelessness. First, do no harm. Now, of course, it's pretty easy to point out that this is a ridiculous post. At least it should be, but there are a worrying number of people in the comments agreeing with this guy. Firstly, do no harm isn't some kind of reviewer's mantra. It's part of the oath doctors take. I think it's pretty ridiculous to compare the importance of a review to the importance of a doctor potentially harming a patient. Secondly, I'm not sure what this guy thinks that reviewers like Marquez are supposed to do, which is what Marquez says as well in a reply to that tweet. We disagree on what my job is. I agree with Marquez. A reviewer's job isn't to censor their reviews for the benefit of a company. It's to provide their own completely subjective opinion on something and explain why they feel that way, which is exactly what Marquez did in his review. There's no code of ethics for reviewers. In fact, having a code of ethics would make reviews be completely untrustworthy as you'd never be able to know if the reviewer is telling the truth or if they're constrained by some nebulous concepts so that they don't accidentally point out too harshly how bad a product is and have an effect on that product's 
sale. I mean, the entire point of reviewing a product is to affect its sales, to get people to buy it or to get people not to buy it based on what you think about it. Given the Humane AI pin is priced at $700 and needs a subscription on top of that, I think it's actually more ethical to point out how bad it is. It's kind of clear that Marquez doesn't think anyone should buy this product, at least not the average person at this point. So his title gets the point across exactly how he wants it to be. He thinks it's a waste of money and that no one should buy it in its current state. So this is the worst product I've ever reviewed for now. Gets that point across pretty easily. Daniel, in the viral tweet, seems to have the understanding that a company with a bad product going out of business is a bad thing. But in reality, I think it's only a good thing. It stops people from wasting money, but it's also the law of nature. That's social Darwinism, buddy. The humane people don't seem to get this either. With Sam Sheffer, the head of new media at Humane, and the most vocal of their spokespeople I've seen, saying, easy to dogpile, much harder to build. Yes, the software is not where it needs to be. Full stop. And that's entirely on us. The overwhelming negative sentiment? What happened to optimism? What happened to pushing things forward? Which is kind of low-key shaming not just Marquez, but all the negative reviews by attempting to establish the argument that people should have been more optimistic and help them push the humane AI pin forward. But no one is required to be optimistic. No one's required to help you push your $700 fancy talking paperweight forward. You're a company. If you can't make a product people want to buy, then you go out of business. Granted, I don't think humane is that far down the financial difficulty pipeline yet, but who's going to invest in a company that put out such an underwhelming product? Especially considering this thing was hyped up as the next big thing. If Humane wanted optimism, they should have waited until the technology caught up with their ideas before releasing it, or at least priced the pin as a novelty item, not at a similar price point to a smartphone. Because its massive price tag and its basic uselessness when compared to a smartphone are what's going to end their company, not a review from Marquez. What do you guys think? Do you think that Marquez really has that much sway? Or is it more that they put out a bad product and he's just pouring salt on the wound? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching all the way till the end. Remember to like and subscribe. After all, you watched the whole video. Have a great day and God bless you. So, everyone knows what Yu-Gi-Oh is. Even if you haven't played the card game, you've seen the show before. Don't lie, growing up in the 2000s, every guy I knew had a Yu-Gi-Oh phase. Though, when I played it as a kid, I never actually understood the rules and basically just went with what made sense to me based on my knowledge from the show. There are people who still play competitively to this day. It's especially big in Japan, which is where today's story comes from. Apparently, there was a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament that smelled so bad that people had to flee the event, and one woman's post about it went viral on Twitter. So I mean, we all know that gamers, especially card gamers for whatever reason, can tend to marinate a little bit and develop their own unique gamer aroma, and it's usually not the most pleasant of smells. Well, Yu-Gi-Oh has this issue a lot at their tournaments. Not sure why Yu-Gi-Oh gets it worse than other games, but apparently they do. To the point that in 2019, they had to institute a rule for their competitive in-person events that players must be recently washed and wearing clean clothes. I wish I was kidding. The rule says, you are expected to be clean when you enter a tournament. Neglecting to wash or put on clean clothes contributes to an unpleasant atmosphere at the event. As the tournament can be crowded and the day can be long, persons who neglect self-care to the point that they are negatively impacting the tournament may be asked to correct the issue in order to continue in the event. I genuinely can't think of any other game where this is such an issue that they have to make an actual rule about it. And well, I had to live with this knowledge, so now you do too. Anyway, the post we're talking about today went viral in Japan and comes from a dude who was competing at the tournament. His tweet's in Japanese, so I'll show the original quickly and then the translated version. The translation is a bit rough because Japanese doesn't translate greatly into English in this manner, so I'll paraphrase. He said, Recently at a Yu-Gi-Oh event, I met a girl who said, I'm playing Master Duel and this is my first time at a Yu-Gi-Oh event. In my area, at the exchange meeting, there were a lot of hard to beat decks. I wondered if I would be able to win and sure enough, I lost to a guy using a BF deck. I wasn't used to it and my deck wasn't powerful enough. To make matters worse, the girl left midway through. I hope she didn't come to hate Yu-Gi-Oh because she lost to a man with a powerful Yu-Gi-Oh deck. If you're a man, please be kind to women because having more women play Yu-Gi-Oh is a good thing. Basically, this guy met a girl at a Yu-Gi-Oh event, which must have been such a rare occurrence that he not only noted it, but was able to tell when she wasn't there anymore. And he felt bad because he thought that she must have lost a duel and gotten upset and left because of that. And he thinks that there should be more women playing Yu-Gi-Oh, which I mean is kind of a weird thing to tweet, but at least his heart is in the right place, I think. Anyway, I don't think anyone would be prepared for what the girl responded with. She saw this tweet because it went a little viral in Japanese Yu-Gi-Oh circles and quote tweeted it. I suspect she knew it was talking about her because she was most likely the only 
woman at the event. She said, and again, this is a translation, I saw this because it was circulating, but considering the circumstances, it might be me. I left halfway through because I couldn't stand the smell. It's not like I lost or was sad. She left the event because of the smell. The dude wrote a whole long tweet thinking that she had lost a hard battle and was feeling bad about it, but it turned out that she just couldn't handle the absolutely pungent gamer aromas that were permeating the room. I don't really know of a more brutal way to shut someone down. Because of the juxtaposition of the two tweets and the hilarity of the actual reason she left, this tweet went viral and is now sitting at 23, almost 24 million views on Twitter. That's 23 million people who now know to avoid their local Yu-Gi-Oh convention from now on. Anyway, I just thought this was kind of funny, that a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament could smell so bad that people literally had to leave before it was halfway over, solely because the gamers were just too powerful. I mean, that's the kind of thing you see in a South Park episode and think, it can't really be that bad, but it turns out that it can. Have you ever had any experience with a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament? Did you have to leave early? Let me know. Thanks for watching all the way till the end. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. After all, you watched the whole video. Have a great day and God bless you.